This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, good evening. How's, every, how's everybody doing, okay? Great, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I've been asked to give a talk on something that is near and dear to my heart, which is the development of the craniofacial complex. The title for tonight's talk is How to Get Ahead in Life, the Development of the Craniofacial Complex. Uh, my name is Rich Schneider, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery as well as the Department of Orofacial Sciences and the Department of Cell and Tissue Biology here at UCSF. So what I want to do tonight is kind of give you an appreciation for all the things that have to happen in order for us to build our head. This was something that I got interested in as an undergraduate. It's what drew me to science in the first place, which was really trying to understand all the things that have enabled us to do what we do in our natural world. My ability to give a lecture to you and for you to sit there in the audience and receive the information is all really a consequence of the sum total of many different events that happen during development. And I've been fascinated by this uh, since I started uh, my career. Uh, really what we think about um, when we think about the development uh, of the head is something that is the byproduct of over 500 million years of vertebrate evolution. Uh, the head is an, uh, a feature that's an innovation for, for vertebrates, um, which are also known as craniates. Craniates um, refers to the fact that they've evolved a head. If you look at our ancestors in the uh, ancient oceans, uh, some of the other deuterostomes, things like uh, echinoderms and so on, there is no centralized component of their body. Uh, it's something that evolves independently uh, in our lineage. So what is it about the head uh, that has enabled us to achieve all that we've been able to achieve over time. Uh, and what is it about the head that enables us to uh, do the many things that we do on a daily basis? So I just want to give you an appreciation for that and kind of walk you through many of the um, underlying developmental mechanisms that enable the head to form. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, I've uh, been asked to ask you to hold those questions and we can save them for the end and we can have a discussion uh, as long as you'd like. Um, so uh, uh, with that, I will uh, begin to explore with you kind of this idea of what is in a head. So first of all, in the most obvious anatomical sense, if we kind of peel off the outer layers of the head. We're left with very superficial components. We've got a whole peripheral nervous system that is innervating our skin, and um, we've got uh, um, much of the sensation uh, in our uh, epidermis, and, and dermis is all uh, um, innervated by this peripheral nervous system. And we have superficial muscles that lie on the outside of our heads. Uh, if we go a little bit deeper, we have muscles that control our expressions. So our ability to smile, our ability to wink, our ability to wiggle our ears, if, if anybody can do that. Uh, that all comes from these very superficial muscles of expression. Slightly deeper to that, we have muscles of, of chewing or mastication uh, that are shown here. So these are the muscles that, that close and open the jaw. We also have muscles that move our eyes in their orbit. So we've got these extrinsic eye muscles or ocular muscles that move the eye in its orbit. We've got blood vessels that bring oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to our head. Okay, that's part of the circulatory system. 
Um, if we look even deeper within the head, we've got the components of the central nervous system, so the different regions of the brain that are all involved in, in uh, the functions of our, of our sensory and uh, motor systems. Uh, we also have sense organs, uh, the organ of smell in the, in the nasal capsule. Uh, we've got our oral cavity shown here. Uh, here's the tongue, and we've got a palate that divides the nasal capsule from the oral cavity. Uh, here you can see the tongue. Uh, and the tongue is endowed with different buds of taste uh, that allow us to distinguish uh, a variety of flavors. Uh, we've got the eye, which allows us to see the natural world, composed of the, eye, the lens and the retina and a component of the cranial nerve shown here, cranial nerve two. Here are the eye muscles that move the eye. We've got the ear, uh, composed of an external, a middle, and an inner ear that connects with the, um, with the rest of the head, in this case, the auditory tube that connects with the, the throat and the pharynx. And then all of this sits either within or on top of the skeleton of the head. This is the skull, uh, which is composed of a lower jaw or mandible, an upper jaw or maxilla, and the teeth uh, that sit on the jaw skeleton. Uh, and then we've got this cranial vault that surrounds the brain and is a site of attachment for those jaw muscles that open and close the jaws. Uh, if we look at the bottom of the skull, you can see this is the foramen magnum, which connects the skull to our spinal cord. And um, then we can see the roof of the mouth. These are the bones of the palate here. So what you've just got an overview of are the different tissues, the skeletal, muscular, vascular, nervous uh, tissues and connective tissues of, of the head complex. Um, and what I want us to think about then is where all of these tissues come from and how do they become assembled during development. Uh, they have to start in some place and at different times they have to come together and communicate with one another and form this highly integrated craniofacial complex. So how does that happen? And the goal really of research in my lab and many other labs is to identify the molecular and cellular mechanisms or processes that control head development and enable the structural and functional integration of all these different parts. So how do muscles learn where to attach to bone? And how do those bones then move in relation to other structures? And how do blood vessels and, and connective tissues all come together with the hard and soft tissues to build this craniofacial complex? Okay. So by searching for these molecular and cellular mechanisms, uh, we can begin to understand how the head comes together. And in, in particular, we're going to ask the question of how do the craniofacial precursor cells, those cells that will give rise to muscle or give rise to bone or cartilage or a nerve, how do they learn where and when to differentiate, that is to form appropriately patterned components of the head? Okay. So where and when does muscle learn to become muscle and bone learn to become bone? And how do those things all come together to build our craniofacial complex? Now you might ask why is this an interesting question? And really the bottom line is what we want to do is provide the data that are necessary to induce repair and regeneration of many tissues that are affected by birth defects, disease, or trauma. So the craniofacial complex is one of the most highly affected systems uh, in terms of birth defects, okay? So somewhere between one out of every 300 to 500 live births has a defect in the craniofacial complex. We also have many diseases, oral cancer and others, that potentially if we understood how these tissues were formed, how they became, um, how they differentiate, how they become integrated, then we could use that information to regenerate these tissues in cases of, of disease or birth defects or in the cases of trauma. Okay, so how are we gonna go about solving this? I'm imagining you're sitting out there thinking that um, this is a pretty overwhelming kind of a question. There's so much complexity in the head. There's so many different parts. How would we even begin to approach this question? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay out for you the strategy that I've been using in, in, in our lab to get at this question, to get at these, um, at these different questions. And the work that we do really um, uses an animal model system. Uh, it takes advantage of the fact that uh, birds come from an egg, 
and those eggs are highly accessible during development. That means we can open them during development and we can study the processes as they're happening. Uh, we can also manipulate those processes uh, and try and understand cause and effect. Okay, so we have accessibility of these embryos of these developing birds. Um, we also have the ability to um, watch as development progresses. So here is uh, a series of images of a developing chicken embryo. Um, this is right after fertilization. Okay, we call this stage one. Uh, and then you can see as development progresses, um, the embryo begins to take a variety of different forms until by the time you get out here at stage 35, we have something that looks recognizably like a chicken, right? Looks somewhat like a chicken. Uh, you can see the beak and the eye. Uh, the neck, so this is the head region, and really what we want to understand is where do the cells and tissues that will give rise to the head come from, and how do they come together and interact. And, and what I'll tell you is that the stages for the uh, initiation of these processes that we're most interested in are these stages shown here in this red dashed box. So pretty much from around a stage uh, seven, eight, all the way up to around stage 10 and 11. And I'm gonna focus a lot of our attention on, on these stages, because this is really where the beginning of the patterning of the craniofacial complex um, happens, and, and this is really um, a lot of the real interesting things as far as um, the early developmental events, okay? So uh, just as a point of reference, I'll be, I'll be talking about stages throughout our, this uh, lecture. Um, these are the Hamburger Hamilton stages. They're named after the embryologist who defined these stages. You'll see HH stage, and you'll see things like HH21 or HH9 and a half. And that just refers to the stage where we can use anatomical features to identify a particular embryo in its development. There are staging systems for humans and mice and so on, and so uh, we can identify comparable stages in different species. Okay, so as I said, we're gonna focus initially on these early stages. Um, this is a stage nine and a half uh, quail embryo. Uh, this is the developing head shown here. So this is gonna give rise to the brain and the spinal cord. You're looking at it through a window in the top of the egg. We just cut a little window about the size of a dime. We can look down into the egg under a microscope. And so here you can see this is the developing brain shown here. And if we take a cut through this embryo, right around here, through this portion of the brain, um, and we look at the different tissues that are developing in this embryo, um, I've pseudocolored them here for you. Um, and so what you can see in purple is this hollow tube-like structure. This is the spinal cord and the brain. Um, this is right through the region we call the midbrain. Uh, then we've got this lighter blue tissue. Uh, this is the outer layer of tissue we call the ectoderm, okay? And both the brain and this lighter blue are derived from this tissue called the ectoderm. We just subdivide them into the neural ectoderm, that is the ectoderm that will give rise to the nervous system, so the, the brain, and the non-neural ectoderm that will give rise to things like the integument, like the skin, for example. Um, and then this purple tube, this neural tube, sits on top of a variety of other structures. Um, these orange cells shown here are a population of cells called the mesoderm. And then this yellow structure here is going to be part of the oral cavity. That's what we call the pharynx. That's derived from the endoderm. And then on top of this neural tube is a population of cells that I really have made my living studying, and those are a population of cells called the neural crest. And these neural crest cells, as their name would imply, are the neural um, descendants uh, that sit on the crest, the top of this neural tube. Um, and that's just, those cells are labeled here. So we've got the non-neural ectoderm, shown here in blue, the neural ectoderm, which is gonna give rise to the brain and, uh, and spinal cord, the neural crest, shown here in pink, and the mesoderm, shown here in orange, and the endoderm, shown here in yellow. Okay, so if we take a slightly uh, different view, uh, back, back to this view through the top of the egg, uh, what we can see is I've labeled two of the populations of cells, uh, the neural crest shown in pink and the mesoderm shown in orange uh, from stages eight to stages 11. And what you can see is that here again is the, 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 the neural tube, the brain, the forebrain and the midbrain, and then this is forming the spinal cord in the, in the trunk. Um, and you can see these pink cells are beginning to emerge on the top of this neural tube. 
and there's a large population of them here. And then they begin to move laterally, and they're going to move ventrally, and they're going to fill out the whole region of, of the face. Um, just a few other things here. You can see these are where the eyes are forming on either side of the forebrain. Uh, here's the beginning of the heart. Has anybody ever seen a chicken embryo developing in an egg? No. It's a pretty amazing thing right at this stage to all of a sudden start to see this spontaneous beating of this heart. And then a few stages later, you start to see blood vessels that are flowing through this embryo. Um, I want to give you an appreciation for what these cells look like. I'm showing you static pictures, but these are very uh, dynamic events. So there's a lot of movement, and there's a lot of things that are happening. Uh, these are neural crest cells that have been labeled um, by some colleagues of mine, Paul Kalesa and Scott Frazier. Uh, these neural crest cells are labeled, and they're migrating, they're moving out of the neural tube. Uh, and you can see that shown here. Okay, So here these cells are all leaving the neural tube, and they're going to have a variety of destinations in the craniofacial complex. Okay, So here they are moving and distributing themselves. Okay, And if we follow all these cells, and we look either in the head of a bird, in this case a chicken, or in the head of a mouse, uh, or a mammal in general, so humans would fall in this category, we can see that those neural crest cells are going to wind up populating the front of the head skeleton. Okay, So whether you're a bird or a mouse, um, a bird or a mammal, you're going to have neural crest cells that are giving rise to all of the skeletal and connective tissues that are in the front of your, uh, of your head. Um, and here are just some examples of how, when we label those cells, these are um, two examples of, of, of embryos where these neural crest cells were labeled at that stage before they migrated, and then they migrate down into the, into the head region, and they give rise to a whole variety of tissues uh, that I will talk about in a minute. But you can see that there's a nice boundary that is the same, in a, whether you're in a bird or a mammal, uh, that separates all the regions of the face that are derived from neural crest cells versus regions of the, of the head that are not derived from the neural crest. Okay, So as I said, these neural crest cells are going to migrate, and they're going to give rise to a variety of different tissues. They give rise to the skeletal tissues, like bone and cartilage. And if you're a mammal, they give rise to the dentin of your teeth. Uh, they give rise to some neural tissues, like some of the neurons in the peripheral nervous system, uh, sensory ganglia and glia that are associated uh, with the nervous system. They give rise to a variety of connective tissues, like in the integument, they give rise to the dermis, as well as fat. Uh, they give rise, they contribute to vascular tissues, so they, there are certain cells that, that participate in the formation of blood vessels, as well as the smooth muscles that are involved in blood vessel formation. But those other tissues, these neural crest cells, are not just forming in isolation. Those other tissues are also forming simultaneously. And so the neural ectoderm is giving rise to the neural tissues, like the brain and the motor nerves and the retina of the eye. The non-neural ectoderm is giving rise to what we call the epidermal tissues, like nails or hair, or if you're a bird, feathers and beaks. And then the mesoderm is also giving rise to skeletal tissues in the back of the head, like bone and cartilage of the skull. It's also giving rise to connective tissues, like the dermis and the fat. Um, it's giving rise to all the voluntary muscles, so all the ability, all the muscles that move your mouth um, or your um, or your uh, muscles of expression, those are all derived from the mesoderm. Uh, the mesoderm is also giving rise to all the blood vessels and other cell types. And then finally, that last population, the endoderm, is giving rise to the tissues of the oral cavity, the pharynx, um, such as the auditory tube, uh, many of the glandular tissues, like the thyroid, the thymus, and the parathyroids. Okay, So all of those precursor populations that we talked about have a variety of derivatives. Now, these derivatives, again, don't just form in isolation. Uh, these tissues have to interact with one another. They, they most likely have to talk with each other all along the way so that muscle knows where to connect, uh, which part of the skeleton it needs to connect to, so that blood vessels or nerves know where to go in order to make those muscles move, in order to make those skeletal elements move. So again, the big question is, how does that happen? So if we look in a schematic view of these developing embryos. Here's an embryo in, you're looking in a cross section uh, at around stage eight. You can see the neural tube. You can see that mesoderm. Uh, by stage 10, we can see these neural crest cells shown in pink that are migrating out. Okay, and they're beginning by stage 12 to intermix with the mesoderm. Uh, and they're sandwiched between this neural ectoderm and this non-neural ectoderm and this pharyngeal endoderm. Okay, so spatially, 
they're all packed in there and they're interacting with one another. And eventually by stage 17, we've got these neural crest cells that are moving down into what's gonna be the developing jaw region. And you can see that the mesoderm is gonna give rise to the muscle shown here in this red, um, surrounded by neural crest cells shown here in pink. And as these cells develop and as they mature, they're gonna give rise to all the bone and the cartilage and the muscle, and they start their lives closely associated with one another uh, in the developing uh, jaw region. Okay, so there's still a lot we have to understand about how these early interacting and early migrating populations go from simply, in this case, a highly schematized version of these cells interacting with one another to forming the, the adult structures that we, um, that we started thinking about in the beginning of the lecture. So really, in order to get at that question of how these cells progress and how they interact with one another, um, I want to pose a question, really, and it's, it's kind of a complicated question, but I'm going to break it down for you so that um, we can think about it and we can begin to take all the data that I'm going to show you and fit it into, these, into this question. So really, if we want to understand how craniofacial developments, or really any complex system, any complex biological system, we need to understand what the hierarchy is. What are the rules within that system, okay? Is it like an orchestra where there's a conductor and that conductor, everyone's reading the same score, but that conductor is emphasizing different components of the orchestra, the, the strings or the brass or whatever to play at different times. So we wanna understand what is the hierarchy in this system? So what are the hierarchical levels of organization? Okay, just like any complex organization, there's probably a hierarchy. Um, and then also, as these, tissues and these cells move through time and space, what are the critical conversations that they're having with one another? How do they know who they are in time and space, and how do they assemble into this complex three-dimensional structure? So really, that question then is, what are the hierarchical levels of organization, and what are the critical interactions that control craniofacial development? Okay, so again, to break it down, we can think about our progenitor populations, whether you're the neural crest or the mesoderm or the non-neural ectoderm or the neural ectoderm or the endoderm, and assume that during development, they're all having a variety of interactions with one another. Okay, and then these interactions are somehow driving each of these precursor or progenitor populations to give rise to their derivatives. So in the case of the neural crest, perhaps interactions with the mesoderm or the non-neural ectoderm is allowing these neural crest cells to form skeleton or other connective tissues. These interactions are driving the differentiation of these epidermal appendages like hair or feathers or so on. Um, and these kinds of interactions are driving the differentiation of muscle, uh, blood vessels, and so on, okay? And we wanna understand when are the critical interactions happening and who is giving the information that is driving these processes, okay? So the experimental strategy that we've been using in my lab to get at this question um, is taking advantage of the fact that we can access avian embryos, bird embryos, during development, and we can transplant cells. We can move them around and we can challenge them in their environment and ask, to what extent do they contain within them information for driving a particular process, for making a particular tissue, or to what extent do they require information from their environment in order to make that tissue, okay? So what we do is we're gonna, in this case, we're gonna take neural crest cells and replace them by another population of neural crest cells and then ask, what are the downstream effects on these other tissues? So if we do an experiment like this and we see that there's no effect, that the tissues develop as they normally would, then we know that these neural crest cells are downstream in the hierarchy. That is, they're receiving information from their environment, from the, from the host. Okay. But if we do a transplant and the neural crest cells change the outcome, then we know that those neural crest cells are higher up in the hierarchy. And if they change the outcome, then we can ask, what did they do differently to make that outcome change? And we can ask and analyze those questions on a variety of different levels. We can ask whether those changes are happening at the level of the genes, whether those are happening at the level of cells communicating with one another, or in the formation of tissues like bone and cartilage, or in the formation of organs like the jaw, or in the formation of systems, like the skeletal system of the head or the muscular system of the head, okay? So we can manipulate the system in one way and then ask how does, it, how does the whole complex change at these different levels, okay? And so for, we've been doing this in my lab for about 12 years, um, and I'm just gonna talk, I'm gonna give examples, some proof of principles about how um, 
these transplantation experiments affect the development of the skeleton, affect the development of these epidermal appendages uh, and the musculature. But we've also spent a lot of time looking at these other tissues as well. Okay. So again, we're going to focus on the bird skull, the bird head. We're going to take advantage of the fact that we can ex access the embryo any time between um, the, the fertilization that happens in the egg to the development of the head skeleton. Uh, we're also going to take advantage of the fact that we know um, where these different parts of the skeleton come from. So this is a quail embryo. You can see here's the eye and the upper and lower portions of the beak. These are developing feather buds, which are the epidermal appendages that we will focus on. Uh, there's also a little egg tooth that forms at the tip of the beak, shown here. Here's the ear opening. Here's the nostril. Here's the lower jaw. And if we go backwards in time, this is a stage 25 embryo. We're looking straight on at the face of this quail embryo. So here are the eyes on either side. This is the portion of the head that's going to give rise to the mid and upper face, or the upper portions, the mid and upper portions of the beak. Uh, this is the upper portions of the cheek, and this is the lower jaw. So these are the what we call the front and nasal process, the maxillary primordia, and the mandibular primordia shown here. Um, and here we can see how these different primordia, in this case the maxillary and the mandibular, uh, relate to the formation of the skull, of the head skeleton, shown here. So this blue region is the upper and lower portions of the jaw. This pink region is the upper portions of the beak, shown here. Um, and what that maps to in this stage nine and a half embryo, where those neural crest cells are coming out, um, are the neural crest cells that come from the forebrain and the midbrain, shown here in pink and blue. So there's a direct correspondence uh, in what we call a fate map between these cells that leave this early neural tube and settle in this region of the face and ultimately will give rise to the bones and cartilages of the skull. So when I started thinking about this problem, when I first came to San Francisco in 1998, um, I had spent a lot of time for my PhD uh, and, and um, thinking about the origins of this beak skeleton. And I, I was out on Ocean Beach, and I was watching all these brown pelicans fly by, which are shown here. Um, and it occurred to me that I knew exactly where all the cells that were going to give rise to this long beak in a brown pelican, where, they, where those cells came from. Um, if you can think about birds for a second, you can appreciate the tremendous amount of diversity that there is in facial form. Okay? And thinking about that fate map in the previous slide, then at this point in the lecture, you'll all be saying to yourselves, well, of course, all of the beak progenitors are the neural crest cells. And so maybe there's something about the neural crest cells that are giving rise to these beak tissues that might play a role in the diversity of beak form that we see. And so I uh, called a friend of mine. He, uh, he and I got our PhDs together at Duke, and he was a curator of birds at the Bronx Zoo. And I asked him if he could put me in touch with a curator of birds here at the San Francisco Zoo. And um, I wanted to get brown pelican eggs. I thought, you know, if I could get brown pelican eggs, then maybe I could uh, follow the neural crest cells and figure out whether or not they had all the information in them for making a, a brown pelican's bill. Um, but I was told that not only are brown pelicans a protected species, which would make the kind of experiments that I was interested in rather difficult, but I probably could only get maybe one egg a month. And for those of you who have understanding of how animal experiments work, having one egg a month really is not sufficient to do the kinds of experiments that I would be thinking about. So I was a little bit discouraged. Um, but fortunately, San Francisco has one of the largest Chinatowns, if not the largest Chinatown outside of Asia. Um, and I had this light bulb over my head moment when I was walking around Chinatown. I saw these white Peking duck hanging in the window. And of course, white Peking duck have a very uh, distinguished beak. Uh, it's a long, broad bill. Um, and it's quite different than quail and chick and other uh, kinds of birds that have a short, blunt beak. And I asked, would it be possible to take neural crest cells uh, from a duck or a quail and test whether or not they contain within them the information for making a ducks-like bill or a quail-like beak? Um, and so from that, then I, I tracked down a commercial supplier of white peking duck, as well as a commercial supplier of Japanese quail. So these are the uh, commercial species that are bred for the food industry. Um, the, the farms that I get them from breed hundreds of thousands of birds that they ship all over California. We get dozens of eggs, so we're you know, less than 
0.00% of the or 1% of the total production. But you know, it's a um, uh, it's an important experiment, experimental system, and so the farmer is very happy to supply us with these eggs uh, for our science. Um, and so the system that, that we developed was a, a quail duck system. Um, and again, it exploits the differences between these two birds and the size and the shape and their pattern. And, and something else that is important is, is their differences in growth rate. Um, and just like these external uh, features, their internal anatomy, so the muscles uh, that open and close the jaws, for example, or the head skeletons of these quail and duck are very different, okay? And so given everything that I've told you about the origins of these tissues, whether it's the muscles or the bones and the cartilages, I'm sure you realize right away that knowing where these things come from, we can begin to ask questions about what do they know during development and when do they know what they know? So again, using birds, we can simply go backwards in time. We can take our quail embryo here is at a stage 37 or a duck embryo at stage 37. Um, you can see the duck is much larger in size than the quail. Uh, these, are sh these are at the same magnification, but you can see already in the embryo at stage 37, we see very species-specific differences in the duck and the quail, okay? Uh, you can also see the developing feather buds, the eye, and so on. Um, if we go slightly earlier in development, this is a stage 25. Again, looking at the front of the face, we've got the eyes, the mid and upper face, the upper cheeks, the lower jaw forming here around the oral cavity, around the mouth, uh, in a quail and a duck. Uh, and you can already see, appreciate the differences in size and also the differences in proportion between quail and duck. And then back at stage nine and a half, um, you can see the forebrain of the duck and the quail and the midbrain. Uh, one of the things I noticed early on was the difference in shape uh, between the quail and the duck. So we already see species-specific differences between quail and duck, even at this early stage. Uh, and so what I did was I went into uh, quail and duck embryos. I matched them at the same stage, stage nine and a half. And I cut out the neural crest cells from a quail, and I put them in place of the neural crest cells in a duck. Um, again, these are the cells that will give rise to the upper and lower uh, regions of the jaw skeleton in a duck or a quail. And you can see, again, that duck have a long, broad bill and quail have a short, blunt beak, even in these embryos. One of the nice things about using quail is that, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, quail are used as a model system, and there's an antibody uh, that is a stain that we can use that will recognize all the quail cells and not the duck cells. So we can put the quail cells into the duck and then we can put this antibody, this stain, on the, on the chimeric embryo that we have and we can find all those quail cells. And so this is an example of that chimeric embryo. What we've done is we've done a transplant um, and we've taken a section right down through the eye of that chimeric embryo. Um, and so what you can see, here's the eye and the lens and here's the forebrain. And here's the upper and lower portions of the jaw shown here. So the upper portion and the lower portion. All of these black dots represent the quail cells stained with our antibody um, around uh, within the chimeric embryo. And here you can see around in the jaw region, we've got lots of quail cells um, that are just packed into this duck. And what we can ask really is what do these quail cells know? Um, what happens when you put quail cells in a duck? Uh, there's, you know, at least three possibilities. One is you put these quail cells in a duck, and they're just naive cells. They don't have any particular information about being a quail. They just get in there. They're building blocks, and they get all the information from this duck host. And if that were the case, then this chimeric embryo would most likely look just like a duck. Those quail cells would get into the duck, and they would just be patterned normally by the duck, and uh, we would get a, a, a duck's bill. Um, alternatively, you could put the quail cells into a duck, and they get in there, and they're hearing duck, 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 and they say goose. And actually, they, they hear duck, 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 and they say, I'm a quail. I don't understand what you're, what you're talking about. Maybe you know, you're, you're speaking bird, but I don't really get it. And you could have some real miscommunication between the quail cells and the duck cells, and they could make some completely abnormal structure. Or alternatively, you could put the quail cells into the duck, and they hear duck, 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 and they say, I don't care. I'm a quail. And they could interact with a duck. And in so doing, they could exert their dominance in the system and make what we call a quuck, which is a duck host with a quail-like beak. And so what this does is it tells us that these quail cells contain within them all the information for making a short, blunt beak that is specific to a quail. Okay. And of course, I'm sure you're all wondering what the reverse experiment looks like. What does the dwell look like? 
Um, and here you can see this is a quail host with neural crest cells that we transplanted that will give rise to the upper bill. And here you can see the duck-like jaw uh, skeleton, the upper jaw of a duck, uh, and the short lower jaw of a quail in the same embryo. Um, I should tell you now that nothing ever hatches. We, we never let the embryos hatch, um, although I do tell the dental students that if they're, they ask me, you know, what are the quack like, and I tell them if they're really quiet and they go out to Stowe Lake, they can see some of the quack that we release, but we never let anything hatch, and that's the truth. Um, the other question I always get is, you know, what are, what are they like, and I say they, uh, they walk like a quail, they quack like a duck, and they taste like chicken. Uh, but anyway, um, moving on. So really, this, what I thought was a, a tremendous result at the time, that these cells have the ability to make the face of whatever species they are. And, and the, the fact that they could do that, that, that this one population, in the midst of all of those other populations of cells that I showed you, has the capacity to drive development, uh, meant that these cells were doing lots of important things. And so I've spent really the last 12 years uh, since these experiments were published in 2003 trying to understand how do you make a quark. OK. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through some of the interactions that are happening that are, are where these quail cells are exerting their identity, where they are operating at the top of that hierarchy to control craniofacial development. And then I'll close by telling you what that teaches us about craniofacial development in general. OK. So as I alluded to, um, the duck and the quail have a very different shaped beak. You can see that here. These are sections through the eye again. Uh, these are stained with a, a dye that stains bone and cartilage. Um, but what you can appreciate is that the duck, which is the host in the quack, um, has a flat epidermal nail at the tip of its upper jaw. Um, it's like a leathery fingernail. Uh, it's made out of keratin, whereas the quail has this very cone, pointed cone-shaped fingernail that sits on the top. We call that the egg tooth. Okay, And if we look in our quack, well, we can see this is our chimera. Um, again, the beak looks just like a quail um, because it's made by all the quail cells uh, within the duck host. And we can see that here. These are our, our quail cells stained with our anti-quail antibody, shown here in black. Okay, so all these black dots represent the quail cells at the tip of this beak. This is a section right next to this section uh, in the same embryo. But one of the things you'll notice is that there's a region of tissue that's unlabeled shown here, which I've labeled the egg tooth, that's not stained with the quail cells. In fact, it's negative for this antibody. And so what that means is that's coming from the host. And yet, even though it's coming from the host, it has the shape of the egg tooth of the quail. OK, so let me repeat that. So what that means is we've got donor cells that are coming from the quail and host tissues that are coming from the duck. And yet the host tissues have the size and the shape of the quail. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's been a transfer of information at some point, where the quail not only made structures that look like quail in derivatives that it normally would give rise to, in other words, it gives rise to quail-like bone and cartilage, but it also repatterned the duck host to also look quail-like. Okay, So it makes its own structures in a species-specific way, but it also drives the patterning of the host, the duck, uh, in a species-specific way as well. OK. Um, I was interested in how far I could push this system. I also was looking for an excuse to go to Japan and work with a colleague of mine named Raj Lauder. Um, these are emu eggs. Shown here, Raj is uh, holding a whole tray of them. This is the emu, and, which is a flightless bird. Um, and I thought it would be cool to do some quail emu transplants. Um, you can see here's proof that I was in Japan. I think that says Kim Wipes. Uh, and uh, here are the quail eggs, and here is the emu egg. We make all of our own tools for surgery. Uh, and I did the same transplants from a stage 9.5 quail into a 9.5 emu um, and made what we call the cumu. And you can see um, in this embryo, this is a section right down the middle. So here's the developing brain, and here's the oral cavity. And it's, it's a very symmetrical embryo until you get to the jaw region. Uh, and all of these structures are derived from the quail in the emu host. OK, so even in something as different as an emu and a quail, just like the quail and the duck, uh, we can get a very um, 
species specific outcome that is quail like in this emu. Um, we have yet to do the the um, emu into the quail, but I think they're going to be really popular. We're going to call them email. Everybody's going to want them. Okay, dry humor. Um, so anyway, moving right along, I wanted to give you another example of where the quail exerts its identity within the duck host. Uh, these are looking at the development of the feathers. You're looking at the top of the head in a quail at stage 34 and a duck at stage 34. And quail and duck get these very characteristic rows of feathers as they begin to develop. They form these things called placodes. Um, and you can see that as the placodes form in a quail versus a duck, in terms of their size and, and spacing, they're very different. Quail are terrestrial animals, so they have different thermoregulatory requirements. They, they use their feathers to uh, essentially insulate them. Um, but in, in climates where they need to get rid of heat, presumably they have much wider spaced feathers um, that allow them to thermoregulate differently than a duck, which are waterfowl, and they have closely packed feathers that are involved in waterproofing and so on. And so you can see that species-specific spacing and sizing of these feather de developing feather buds. Now, uh, just like the egg tooth, the feather buds are forming from a combination of host and donor tissue. So the outer layer, the epidermis, uh, is what's going to give rise to that placode. So just like our hair and our fingernails, uh, that's going to be forming from the outer layer. Whereas the dermis that sits underneath the epidermis is going to be coming from the donor. And so it goes, uh, feathers develop through a series of discrete stages um, that are well um, uh, synchronized so that you have events that are happening in the dermis and events that are happening in the epidermis. Eventually you have the formation of a short bud and then a long bud. Okay, and what's happening in a quail and a duck are basically the same processes, but they're happening in, in slightly different ways. The quail, again, are making wider, larger placodes, and the duck are making smaller, closely packed placodes. And in our system, we do our transplant. In this case, we're just doing one side of the neural crest rather than both. Um, so if you thought those last quark were uh, kind of freaky, these are even um, more striking. What you can see in the outcome of the chimera is that on the donor side, we've got quail feathers that are widely spaced and pigmented uh, within the white Peking duck host. And so the identity of these feathers, even though it's, they're coming from the dermis, the epidermis is making the feather. So that means, again, we've got a transfer of information from this dermis to the epidermis to make a quail-like uh, pigmentation and, and feather pattern. And you can see here is a feather, a chimeric feather, where we've got the donor cells that are giving rise to the dermis and then the host epidermis shown here. OK, so in both cases, uh, we've now demonstrated that the neural crest cells are higher up in the hierarchy in terms of patterning the epidermis. They transfer whatever species-specific information they have uh, from, uh, from the donor to the host to repattern that host in a uh, quail-like way. And the same holds true in reverse in the dwell. OK, what about in terms of the jaw skeleton? So again, you can appreciate the difference between the quail and the duck in the size of the jaw skeleton. And the um, transplant is essentially the same. We take one side of the quail donor and put that in place of the duck host. And what that affords us is an internal control. Uh, in other words, what we have is an embryo, a chimera, where one side's going to have all the quail cells and one side's going to have all the duck cells. And that allows us to compare in the same embryo what's happening in terms of gene expression or tissue formation on the quail side versus the duck side and compare that um, and ask what's different from one side to the other. And so, again, we can take advantage of our anti-quail antibody. And this is the lower jaw that's developing uh, in our quuck. And we've got the donor side shown here, uh, stained with the anti-quail antibody. And this is just a section through the plane of your lower jaw. So you're looking at the left and right side. This is the, the port, part of your mandible where it comes together at the chin. Um, and this is the back uh, where the jaw attaches um, to the rest of your skull. And so we've got quail cells on this side and duck cells on this side. And the result in the jaw skeleton is that on the donor side, we've got a lower jaw that looks like a quail. And on the host side, we've got a lower jaw that looks like a duck. 
and you can compare that to these other lower jaws. These are stained uh, with two different dyes. The blue is a dye that stains cartilage, and the red is a dye that stains bone. And you can see that the duck has a very characteristic bend to its jaw skeleton, whereas the quail is much straighter. And if you look on the host side, the jaw skeleton uh, is very duck-like in terms of its curvature and size, as, whereas the quail side is like the quail uh, shown here uh, in the control. So how does that happen? So to understand how a population of cells on one side of the embryo can make a quail-like structure, and the other population of cells that are come from the host can make a duck-like structure, we just kept going backwards in time. And so if we look at developing embryos, these are duck at stage 25. Here's the eye and the, here's the brain. And we've stained these embryos with that dye that, that labels cartilage. Um, and the arrow points to the beginning of the jaw skeleton. So at stage 25, uh, we don't see any cartilage in the jaw skeleton. We see cartilage forming underneath the brain and underneath the spinal cord. Uh, and if we compare that with a stage 28, in this case a quail or a duck at stage 28, you can see the tip of the arrow. There's cartilage forming uh, at the upper and lower portions of the jaw, stained blue. Now, if we take these embryos and we cut them, we section them, uh, what we can see is that in each of our chimeras, we're going to have a host side and a donor side. And the donor side has all of these neural crest cells that are labeled with our anti-quail antibody, whereas the host, cell, the host side is unlabeled. Um, and this is at a stage 25, and so at a stage 25, we shouldn't yet see any cartilage in the jaw skeleton. But what happens is, because the quail is a faster developing bird, it actually takes a quail 17 days to go from fertilization to hatching, and it takes a duck 28 days. So when we put the quail cells into a duck, it acts out its program on a much faster timetable, which allows us to see all the events that are controlled by the quail donor. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, that was just kind of a serendipitous aspect of the system. But what you can appreciate is that wherever we have these quail cells, we have an acceleration of the, of the program that makes cartilage. So here on the donor side, we see uh, highly uh, stained cartilage for the upper and lower portion of the jaw. But on the, don on the host side, uh, we don't see any staining, meaning that in the same embryo, one side is acting out the quail-like program, and one side is acting out the duck-like program. And we can look at gene expression. So here's a gene called collagen type 2. It's a gene that makes the protein that makes cartilage. And we can see high levels of collagen type 2 expression on the donor side. Uh, we can also see protein for collagen type 2 shown here on the donor side, but not on the host side. And this donor side looks much more like a quail at stage 28, three stages later. And so we've got this uncoupling in the same embryo of the donor versus the host. But what, what this tells us is that these quail cells are executing their program for making cartilage autonomously. They're doing it on their own. They're driving the process on their own without waiting for the host. Okay, So they are higher up in the hierarchy. They are driving the process. And in so doing, they're making quail-like structures in this duck host. Okay, So that's in terms of cartilage. In terms of bone, we see about the same thing. So here's the lower jaw. Uh, you're just looking at a section through the lower jaw, and you can see all the quail cells on one side and all of the duck cells on the other. And this, again, allows us in the same embryo to compare what's happening on one side versus the other. And if we look in these embryos that are stained with a marker called alkaline phosphatase, and this is a marker that tells us wherever bone is beginning to form. So if we see alkaline phosphatase activity, we know that bone is being made by the cells. And if we look in a normal control duct at stage 26, we see a little bit of alkaline phosphatase activity on the margins of the upper and lower portions of the jaw. But if we look in our chimera, where we've got all these quail cells on one side, what we see is that the quail-derived side is making bone at a much faster rate uh, on a quail-like timetable. And if we look where this bone begins to form and become mineralized, uh, we can see that in these embryos where we stain with that red dye for the presence of mineral, the presence of bone, uh, we can see that in the chimera down this middle column, uh, the host side, when the host side has no bone, the donor side already has bone. And here again, you can see when the host side begins to form bone, the donor side, the quail cells as well, advanced in the formation of bone, and so on. And so we see again this uncoupling of the program for making bone 
on the host side relative to the donor side. And what that tells us is that the quail cells are executing the program for making bone autonomously. Okay. And so we can just continue to go through the different systems. We've now looked at the epidermal appendages. We've looked at bone and cartilage. We can now look at muscle uh, and ask, do the neural crest cells play a role in patterning the muscle that attaches to these bones? So again, this is a uh, embryo. These are embryos from the duck and the quail. They're staying with bone and cartilage. You can appreciate the differences uh, in the jaw. This is the jaw joint. So the beak is out here. Uh, this is the jaw joint in the duck and the jaw joint in a quail. Here's the eye in the quail and the eye in the duck. Uh, one of the things you might uh, realize is that a, a duck feeds through a very different mechanism than a quail. So quail peck at seed on the ground like a chicken, whereas duck, uh, they lift up sediment, they filter sediment through their beaks. They have a very different uh, way of feeding. They use a lever arm system, and you can appreciate how big and robust this duck lower jaw is compared to the quail lower jaw. Uh, but because of these differences, or in, in, in conjunction with these differences, we also have very different muscle arrangements and muscle um, proportions. So in the duck, so again, here's the upper and lower portions of the jaw, which is shown here, the upper and lower portions of the jaw. And there are muscles that originate on the side of the skull and insert on this bone here and are allowing that jaw to close. They're, when they contract, they pull the jaw up. And you can see those muscles right here. So these are the jaw closing muscles. And they're very large, and their proportion is much larger than the quail. So it's not just a, a size increase, but it's a proportion change. Um, so here you can see those same muscles in the quail on the upper and, um, along the upper and lower portions of the jaw relative to the duck. And so we can ask in our chimeric system, if you remember, the neural crest cells are giving rise to the bones and cartilages, but the mesoderm is giving rise to the muscle. That means the mesoderm is going to come from the host. And so here again, in our chimera, these pink cells with the neural crest, they're going to give rise to the bone and cartilage. The muscle is going to come from these orange cells. And if we look in our chimeric mandible in the same orientation, you can see all the neural crest cells from the donor quail stain black. But then we see these muscle cells that are unlabeled that are coming from the duck host. And we can ask, and we can, we can stain them with a muscle marker. This is a gene called MIF5 that's expressed in, in developing muscle. OK, so we can ask, if the neural crest cells are involved in patterning the muscle, will we see differences in the, um, in the muscle anatomy in our chimera? In other words, if the neural crest cells are informing the patterning of muscle, then quail neural crest cells should change the anatomy of the duck muscle to be more quail-like. And that would tell us that the quail cells are higher up in the hierarchy, or that, that neural crest cells are higher in the hierarchy than muscle. Whereas if the muscle looks more like a duck, then we know that the muscle and the quail are either independent uh, or the muscle is higher in the hierarchy. And so what we see, though, in our chimeras um, is that if we look, these are uh, reconstructions of the developing muscle. Uh, these are quail and duck shown here. You can see the proportion of the duck. This is the midline. So these are symmetrical. They're mirror image along the midline. And you can see the, the, the um, sides of the quail on either side of the midline and the duck shown here. And in our quack, in the quack column shown here, we can see that the host side of the quack, which is duck, looks very duck-like. Whereas the donor side is asymmetric from the host side and has a shape that is more like that of the quail. Okay. And so what we see, um, and the same holds true slightly later, is what we see is that the quail neural crest cells, which give rise to all the connective tissues that surround the muscle, they change the shape of the muscle and they change where that muscle inserts. Okay. So they're providing species-specific information to the muscle and they're helping to repattern that duck muscle to be more quail-like. Okay. So then, uh, in conclusion, I want to leave you with this idea that the neural crest patterns and integrates the craniofacial complex during development and during evolution. We're looking at uh, quail and duck and emu, and, and we can extrapolate this information to humans and other vertebrates um, that the neural crest cells shown here are really at the top of the hierarchy, and they're driving the integration, the structural and functional integration of all of these tissues in the craniofacial complex. Okay, and in so doing, they enable this complex to come together and, and form you know, the face that we see, uh, such as in Elvis, 
Uh, but when we have disruptions to these neural crest cells during development, uh, we know that the outcome is, is rarely very, um, is rarely positive for developing embryos. And, and oftentimes, as I alluded to, um, the craniofacial complex uh, is generated with a broad range of defects. Um, in this case, this child has a cleft lip and palate. It's a bilateral cleft lip and palate. That um, This was a child that uh, came to our clinic here at UCSF, the craniofacial clinic. Um, and during the development of this child's palate and craniofacial skeleton, most likely a disruption in the communication among the neural crest cells will give rise to these bones and cartilages. Um, prevented these palatal shelves from closing properly and allowing the oral cavity to be separated from the nasal capsule. So this defect can be repaired through surgery. Um, it's a surgery that has to happen many times throughout the, uh, the growth of the child. Um, and um, you can imagine there are all kinds of implications. There's functional implications when this child is born. Um, he has a really hard time breastfeeding because he can't form a proper seal, um, has problems with speech, has problems with breathing, um, and then there are all kinds of social issues that arise um, just because this child has a, a condition that is outside the range of what we would consider to be normal. So the bottom line is by doing the kinds of experiments that we do in our lab and understanding where and when the cells, the neural crest cells in this case, or the muscles or connective tissues or blood vessels or nerves, where and when they get their information for becoming patterned, for becoming the tissues that they become, and for assembling into these complicated structures, if we understand when that information arises and where it arises and what the genes are, the proteins are that are mediating those conversations, then we believe that we can intervene early in development and uh, prevent these kinds of, of birth defects from arising. Okay, so with that, I want to acknowledge all the folks in my lab who have spent time with me over the years doing the work. Um, I also want to point out where our lab is. It's up here uh, in the Medical Sciences Building on the 11th floor. Um, and uh, the work was done by uh, many different people in the lab. Uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge all of their efforts. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my collaboration uh, with uh, my colleagues in Japan. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the source of funding. Um, the funding for the work has come over the years from the National Institutes of Health, particularly the National Institute of Dental, Dental and Craniofacial Research, um, as well as the March of Dimes. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.